good to see you on this Saturday. It is April the 17th. And for most of us, we are more than way, uh, more than halfway through the school year. So this is an exciting time. Thank you so much for joining me on this Saturday. I am Ms. Drawn, Shanina Drawn, the founder of Bill Reach Teach. I'm an ed educational consultant. I'm a trainer. I'm a dean of students. Mm -hmm. um, and recently, I'm working on becoming a school leader. Um, I'm so excited to talk to you today. Last month, we talked about teacher superpowers. I offered this teacher learning series so we could come together Okay, and just give strategies and ways that we can work together. We, I have said it over and over, there is so much going on right now in education, a lot of uncertainty. Um, and so right now, as we learn today, our session is gonna be focused on, and all of this can be, um, it's all gonna be recorded and you can go to my YouTube channel, which is Bill Reach Teach, and you can catch these videos for the entire series. So today's session is focused on no work again, Supporting your students to get the class work done. This session two is really going to help us understand, and I put this quote at the bottom of the screen, the struggles you're in today is developing the strength you'll need for tomorrow. And so we have been through so much with education as it relates to not only just some of our students that are one, two, three years behind, you throw on this COVID-19 pandemic, remote learning, hybrid schedules, um, the shortest of teachers in Michigan, we are all stressed out, we're all struggling. And so I'm excited to be able to share with you some strategies, some things that we can do, because here's the thing I want you all to know, there's hope in all of this. Um, I talked a lot about our teacher superpowers last month, and there's things within you, no matter what the circumstances are, you can bring out of that student. So I don't want you to feel hopeless. I don't want you to feel like they're missing work. They're not gonna pass. There's things that we can do. And I'm so excited to share that with you. We're gonna get right into it and we're gonna open up with a video. As you look at this video, I want you to think about, you know, what does that mean for you? Um, how can you, you know, relate to it as a teacher, as a parent, as an educator? I want you to do some reflection as we go into this video. This pandemic to America's children now and what's happening in our schools. From New York to Texas to Minnesota, what we found tonight. In some places, failing grades, growing concern over students falling behind, and we ask what can be done. Here's Rachel Scott. 
Tonight, some New York City classrooms open again under new guidelines, including random COVID testing every week. I'm a little nervous about her going back to school. But as the virus surges across the country and many schools remain closed or on a hybrid model, parents and teachers are sounding the alarm on the crippling effects of remote learning. Remember that one? From schools in Illinois. We know that they are falling behind at rates that we are not satisfied with, we are not happy with. It breaks our hearts. Open our schools. To parents demanding schools open in Tennessee. Coast to coast school districts showing rising numbers of students with failing grades. In Houston, 42% of students received at least one F in the first grading period of the year. And in St. Paul, Minnesota, nearly 40% of grades for high school students were Fs, double the amount in a typical year. Those already disadvantaged hit particularly hard, magnifying inequalities for students of color and English learners. Like Tuba Khan, a junior in high school. I used to like math, but you know, like when the, all this started happen, happening, like virtual learning, then I, I start hitting like math. You can do like math online. Tonight, some school districts are trying to figure out how to help those struggling students by changing the grading system or giving extra time to complete assignments. David? This is really important, and we will stay on this. Rachel Scott tonight, thank you. Hi, everybody. So everyone, we just finished that video and I just want your initial thoughts. I mean, so as I'm reorganizing my slides here, just start to think out loud um, what that video means to you. Give me your thoughts on what you thought of the video clip. I know for me, it brings up a lot of anxiety and a lot of um, just, wow, what can we do to help our young people? Those numbers, those failing rates um, as it relates to students failing grades, it's overwhelming. And we know students do not learn um, well remotely or virtually. They need to have in person. And so the, that tells, you know, that speaks volumes to see that students are giving up. They just feel just overwhelmed. And, and so as we think about that, I want you to keep that video in the back of your mind because there's so many things that we need to think about as we move on with this presentation. So a little bit about my life. I am a mother and a wife. Uh, my husband name is Maurice and my daughter name is Marlena. She's a middle schooler. I have been in education for 15 years. I'm a dean of students and I work as a trainer and education consultant. Um, my business is called Bill Reese Teach and I started it to really support teachers um, in the classroom and come up with you know different strategies and techniques that can use to help move. First of all, we say teachers need to take care of themselves first in order to help their students. Um, and the people that have influenced me the most would be my mother and my faith in God. So um, you can also put in the chat, this is an interactive conversation. You can put in the YouTube chat as well as the Facebook chat, any comments or feedback. We're in this together. We're learning together, we're growing together. And so let me learn something about you. I'll be excited to just read some of the comments as we go through our presentation today. Um, so when I think about, you know, Bill Reese Teach, I really think about three things we focus on. Um, I do coaching sessions. I obviously definitely work with teachers in the classroom, but also have an app, a planning period app where it's a resource to help support teachers. So you can go on the Apple store or Google uh, store and just type, type in planning period and the app will come up. It's a great tool to support teachers on all different social, emotional, professional levels. And it's a free app for you to download. So download it and share it. So, but my core beliefs here with Bill Reese Teach is be bold, believe in your ability. Because what we about to go through, I want you to understand some of the things that we're going to suggest to you is going to be bold. We support, I support teachers socially, emotionally, and academically with some tools that will help them become more self-confident on their toughest teaching day. So that means I'm here to support you in any way I can. And I have an entire website called BillReeseTeach.com which you can go on um, at any time to look at more of that information. The other thing I really focus on is embrace and create change. We are in a changing period right now. And so how do we embrace the educational barriers that we're you know, really um, stressed by? So we do that by providing meaningful tools and strategies to create a classroom that you want to see, whether that's virtually or in person. And then the last thing is focus on your teaching destiny. So that whole idea of defining your teacher's superpowers and performing it beyond 
um, what you thought you could do. And so I am excited because I can help you with those things um, in any way to help you feel more confident, more bold, and um, just move forward with your teaching. So I'm excited to um, continue to do those resources. So I need to put that out there, tell you a little bit about me, but we're gonna get right into the presentation of what we're focusing on today, which is our objective. Today, we're focused on ex exploring powerful strategies to help you discover ways to support your students to complete the classwork. They're not turning in the classwork. Um, they're not completing it on time if they are. Some of them are completing the classwork and it's completely not even an, aligned to what you were teaching. And so either they're rushing, they're not completing, they're refusing, um, and there's just a sense of overwhelmness because we know at the end of the quarter or at the end of the trimester, a teacher has to give a grade. And a lot of times that's based on their assessments and what they have done. And so you are put in a very difficult position as a teacher when you have no work, okay? Um, when you have no um, content in front of you to correct. So I want, to I want you to think about this John Maxwell quote that's on the screen. It says, successful and unsuccessful people do not vary greatly in their abilities. They vary in their desire to reach their potential. So regardless of the people that you look around in the world, whether they're successful or unsuccessful, it's not based on their ability. It comes from the gut, the desire to reach their potential. Okay, so when you have a student that is struggling, that is consistently not turning in classroom work, there's a desire there. It's not whether or not they can do it. And sometimes as teachers, educators, we focus on, oh, they can't do it, or they can't learn it. And so when we have to think about, we have to shift our mindset and say, it's not about the ability, it's about the desire whether or not they want to do it. Because sometimes people cannot reach their full potential is because they can't see the potential in front of them. They don't understand how to get to the roadmap. And so we're gonna talk through that. So think about that students or maybe you have more than one student or students, um, and you know that they're struggling. I want you to write their names down and think about the potential that they could have, but they're just not meeting it. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start with shifting our mindset. I kind of already opened up with that. So you see this um, graph here, it says mindset in the, be in the middle, and then it says behavior, our actions, results, performance, attitude. Well, at first, it starts with our attitude. Our attitude and how we see that student, how that student sees themselves will shape their behavior. And as a result of that, will obviously act out. They have an action on how they're going to follow up or not follow up on that. And then there's a result of them performing or not performing. So it's this one big cycle. So for a student, for example, if their attitude is, I can't do it, they're not going to do the work. Their behavior is they're, they're just going to act like they don't care. As a, their action, they're not going to do it. And as a result, they're going to fail um, and get zeros. And so we have to shift the mindset. How do we do that? I love this success. It says, see your goal. We have to teach ourselves first as a teacher, as an educator. Then we have to share this model. By shifting their mindset, you shift the world of the potential. Remember, I told you people want to do well. They have the ability, but sometimes they don't see what's in front of them because their mind is cluttered with negativity, um, a lot of self-negativity talk, self talk, excuse me, that they feel like they can't do it. So one, we're gonna see the goal. You gotta teach your students to see a goal, a small goal. So if they're working on multiplication, you're gonna give them small goals each week. You're gonna chunk them and say, listen, by Friday, I want you to know your multiplication factors one through five or one through three. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to sit there and support you by giving you the, th the tools you need, and then we can have a one on one to practice that. You're going to help them understand their obstacle. You're going to say, I know that you feel behind. I know you feel overwhelmed right now, but I'm here. Even though you may have this obstacle here, I know your potential. So you as a teacher have to see the student potential first before the student can see it. All right. So you're going to help them create a positive mental picture. All right, now you're gonna help them create it. But again, this starts with you. You have to go through these, stage, this, uh, these steps first and then you can introduce these to your students. So we're gonna create a positive mental picture. We're gonna clear 
your mind of self-doubt, okay? You're going to let them know. I always tell students, write positive affirmations um, on your desk or on a piece of paper. You as a teacher may need to do this because whatever you pour into yourself is what come out. So if a kid or even a teacher have negative thoughts about the process, that's what's going to pour out. Whatever you focus on, you get more of. So you may have these little notes and you may see it on my screen. I have a bunch that says, follow your yes. The, bet, the best is yet to come. Just breathe, life goes on. So these are inspiration note cards. Feed your mind with the things that you want that will help you set up a positive mindset. We're gonna embrace that challenge. That's the E. Challenges are um, introduced in our lives to make us stronger, to stretch us. If we didn't have challenges, we wouldn't know how to solve problems. Okay, so we have to have that challenge. We're going to stay on track. We're going to track ourselves. We're going to, you know, have follow up and feedback. And then we're going to show the world what we can do. We're going to show the world what your student or what you can do. So we have to start shifting our mindset in order for us to understand why students are not turning in the work. So let's go deeper in that why. Okay, we're gonna do that right now because I think it's important for us to really step back for a moment and think about, well, why not? Why aren't they doing the work? I wanna read this quote. I'm a quote lady. I love quotes. I love inspirational thoughts because I think at the end of the day, that's what health feeds us. It says, failure doesn't mean the game is over. It means try again with experience. So that mindset, when we fail something, when we get an F or a D, for many students, they completely check out. They don't see the meaning of trying again because it's like, I already failed it, what's the point? But as a teacher, you can flip it and say, listen, the game is not over. It just means that you have to try it again with that same experience. It's okay to be that you're making these mistakes. See it as a mistake and learn from it. And see, when we change the meaning of failure in the classroom, then students are more likely to try again. So let's talk about when we're working with students that are unmotivated. They say, I can, but I won't. I can, but I won't. <laughs> you guys got those students. So there's two things to think about. The first is we have to change and it says his thinking or her thinking so that he um, becomes that he can believe that he can do it to put the effort forward. So he he has to believe or she has to believe they can be successful in those academic tasks. So a lot of times it starts with their mindset. They don't think they can do it. So what's the point? That's the first challenge. The second challenge is to figure out what motivates him or her to identify that setting, that situation or condition that they will respond to and it will be there to help you know, foster their interests or his or her interests, okay? So one, they gotta believe in themselves. Two, we gotta figure out what motivates them, okay? You guys are with me? Um, because I can, but I won't. If something goes back to not the ability, it goes back to the potential and them desiring whether or not they feel like they can do it. So let's talk about this why. Um, why is the class work late? Why is it not turned in? Why is the past due? And I love this, it says, the, the cartoon down here says, I couldn't do my homework because my computer has a virus and so do all my pens and, uh, my pencils and, uh, pencils and pens. So the students sitting there, it's always an excuse with a student. If you all know these students, you know your students, it's always an excuse, an excuse, an excuse. And there's a reason for those excuses. I want to tell you right now, kids, students, kindergarten through 12th grade students, they have a desire to want to do well. They just don't wake up and say, I'm going to be a failure today and I'm not going to turn in my work. There is some, there's some deeply rooted reasons. And in order for us to understand, we're going to have to chase that why for a little bit in order for us to set up a plan and go ahead and push through some strategies to help that particular student. So let's talk about the why. I want to read this poem, okay? Because the first thing we need to do is change our perspective. We're going back to mindset. If you think the, cat, the child don't care, they're never gonna do it, then you know the students can feed off a of teacher energy, whether, on, whether they're on screen or in the classroom. 
kids are very resilient and they're very, um, they can pick up on anything when they feel like a teacher is not connecting. That energy is what I'm trying to say. Kids know teacher's energy. And so if you feel like they don't care, let's see their perspective in a meaningful way. We want to understand the why. So there's this poem, because I ain't got a pencil, OK? Um, and it says, I woke myself up because I ain't got a because I ain't got an alarm, a alarm clock. Drug it dug in my dirty clothes basket because I ain't because ain't nobody watched my uniform. Brush my hair and teeth in the dark because the lights ain't on. Even got my baby sister ready because my mama wasn't home. Got us both to school on time to eat us a good breakfast. Then when I got to class, the teacher fussed because I ain't got a pencil. That's Joshua, Joshua Dixon, um, Dickerson wrote that. And it's a very powerful piece because many of our students get, have something going on. They're not doing the work just because they don't always feel like they don't want to do it. I mean, there is a situation where they're being lazy or but for the majority of students, failure, it, it, it feels really deeply cut. No one wants to be a failure. Let's just make that clear. And so when we change our perspective and see past what we see, then we can start to understand the bigger issue of what's going on with our students. So let's chase these whys for a second. I'm gonna move this out the way so you can see it a little bit. And it says to me, there's some reasons why, and we're gonna go over about seven reasons that I really think, and I know some of these reasons you know, because if you understand the why, perhaps it'll give us a sense of empathy, understanding. Then we can adjust and change and shift our mindset to focus on the things we want in our classroom and try to build assignments and assessments about the need and meet the need of the student. So the first thing is right out the door, social emotional stress of experiencing a world pandemic crisis, COVID-19, has shifted and turned education settings upside down. We all stressed out and overwhelmed with learning from home. I cannot learn this way. Many students are saying that, many teachers are saying, I cannot teach this way. Maybe some people are very comfortable in it, but at the end of the day, you know, most people feel like remote learning is not the best way for kids and students to communicate as it relates to learning in the classroom. That's number one, we're in a pandemic and we as adults are stressful, you know, stressed out. Um, and we've tried to come up with coping skills to deal with our own stress. Can you imagine what these young people are going through? They're overwhelmed. There's a lot of uncertainty. You're in class, you're out of class, you're online, you're not online. Somebody in their family are dying, their communities are around them are dying. Well over 600,000 people in the United States have died. There's a lot of grieving and there's a lot of social emotional stress. And we have to make that a priority in our schools, particularly if we go back full time in the fall as it relates to in-person. The mindset of these students are not okay. Our students are not okay, and I need you to understand that. They're not okay. So with that said, there's a lack of support. That's number two. Many of the students will say, I have no support. No one is there to support me to do the homework because we have parents in the home that's trying to work, trying to make a living, food on the table. These are basic need human beings issues that we're dealing with. So it's not that they don't want to turn in the work. There's a lot of factors that's stopping them from turning in the work. Number three, lack on the low expectation in the classroom. Believe it or not, some students are bored. I'm bored with this class. Um, so they either are just like not in tune. They don't feel challenged. They feel like maybe they went over this. So they, you know, they kind of withdraw and shut down. They're like, I don't care because I'm not really getting anything out of it. Number four, low self-esteem and confidence in the ability to complete the work. Here's the reality. We know certain students are two, three years behind. And with the students almost being out of school for a year and a half full time, because I know some have done remote and some have done in person, they're telling them, I can't do this work. I need more support. I need more support, okay? Number four, well, five, I should say, 
pressures to be successful and achieve. We have students that are achieving, but they're so stressed out. Maybe they were um, an AB student last year, but we see a lot of students that are really, really struggling and they're not even making the grades. They're not even making the grades and they're saying, um, I'm so stressed out, I just hate school. We have, if you look at the data around the country, there's millions of students that are missing attendance wise. Okay, number one. Number two, students that did pretty well last year are not doing well this year. So then we have the double of the D's and F's. Okay, students are behind in learning. That's another reason. I don't understand the material. I cannot complete it. Okay, and the final one, I really want us to understand this because particularly with shifting um, online and being virtual and remote, parents are not equipped or trained to support students at home with classroom work or materials at, time, at times. Here's the parent's perspective. I did not learn this way. What is this? There's many parents that are there trying to support their students, but some of the content, some of the standards, the common core standards and how they learn math is not the same. So yeah, you as a teacher may teach it, but then you know that has to be reinforced. And so the parents are doing the best they can at home to try to reinforce stuff that they didn't even learn this way. And so because we have not trained or equipped the parents to really engage in classroom, almost like classroom management, because they're managing their kids at home, they're overwhelmed and they're shutting down. So now we understand the why. I don't want you to walk away thinking kids and parents don't care, they do. However, we as educators are getting so frustrated and so overwhelmed about these grades that it is really causing a lot of stress on the education systems in which teachers are just leaving the classroom because they feel like they're not appreciated for the work that they're doing. And we already had a teacher shortage, but I think the pandemic has stretched it a little bit more because it's like whatever a teacher's doing, they feel like it's not good enough and they're going back and forth with the student and back and forth with the parent. And so it's this big mess and it doesn't have to be that way. So here's some other reasons why, and I hope you can see this graph, but really it says students don't understand the work, your assignments seem too hard or require too much work, the work is boring, some of the stuff we went through, um, your student doesn't see the point of the work, like how is this going to relate to me, we're going to talk about that, um, they won't, they will only do it to save their grade, so a lot of times students will say, well, I only do it if, if it's going to really count against my grade. They don't see the meaning of consistent work because you and I know by doing the work, it builds that practice, that momentum, that capacity. So when they do have the tests and the assessments, they remember it, they understand the concept concepts and they can master it, right? But if a student's like, oh, I'm just going to do it just to get a, you know, get a grade on this, mm, sometimes they won't complete it. Um, and I, one of the other reasons a student doesn't like you and won't do it anything for you. And I always say that I know that's kind of harsh. Why would a student not like a teacher? Well, it's the same reason why teachers don't like students. Uh, we want to talk about it. Um, kids don't care, you know, kids, students do not care how much you know as an educator until they know how much you care. Students start with the heart, okay? Students always come into the classroom looking for their heart to be filled through relationships and social emotional support. Many educators, educators, excuse me, start with the mind. They're working on building the muscles in their mind so that the student can learn all they need to learn. They're focused on the content, the content, the materials, the resources, the strategies, the teachers are getting in, they're just teaching, 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 teaching. So you have teachers that's focusing on the mind and you have many students that want you to focus on their heart. So there's a disconnect. And sometimes teachers and students don't like each other because I really feel at times there's just a, mm, people have different priorities. I am a believer that you have to marry social emotional support with the academic curriculum. They have to be one. They have to be balanced in the classroom particularly going back into the fall, it has to be a priority in this country. Our social emotional curriculum cannot just come through when there's a problem. We need to put it in the fabric of the culture, checking in, having resources, restorative circles, following up, learning how to communicate and talk to one another, problem solving. All these things matter. 
Now we're not trying to have a big old therapy session, but kids need to be able to know that if they're stressed out, they have a place, a system to go to that will help them manage their anxiety and stress. And unfortunately, many of our educational institutions are reactive. We wait till the kid act out, then we give them help. When we can work together to be proactive in order to be able to help those students and staff move forward. And I'm not just talking about the students. I'm also providing, and I'm saying the teachers, the educators also need wellness, social emotional support, because the reality is teaching is stressful. Listen, I could get on my soap proper about social emotional support. If anything we went through with this pandemic, I pray that the, the Michigan Department of Education, um, and I see they're moving towards that, make social emotional support um, in the classroom as an expectation and not an option for schools. And it's not, oh, I know my students, I'm, I'm not, I'm in relationships. That's, we're going deeper than that, okay? So where are we at? This is where we're at. We're gonna go right into dealing with problems, thinking differently. I'm gonna move myself out the way. Choosing the best way to deal with, with a situation. So you've all had these problems. Okay. And again, if we didn't have a problem, we wouldn't know how to solve them. So a problem is not a negative thing. So when a student work is late, what is the possible solution? Again, we're changing the way we think. We're shifting our mindset. Okay. Student work is late. We're going to flip over to the solution. Maybe students overwhelmed with the workload. If you're a teacher, you have Google Classroom and for one subject, let's just say English, for the, the whole trimester, let's just say a quarter, for the whole quarter, which is about 10 weeks, and you're you know, English teacher, if you assign 70 assignments plus assessments, you would be stressed out and the work would be late. So the idea is, is how much work do you truly need to assign and how many assessments do you really need to put in the system in order to understand that the child mastered it? Sometimes we overwhelm because we see we see work and we're like, oh, we're going to give them this or we're going to do that. Do we need to do all of that and overwhelm the students? Is that necessary for you to measure right and whether or not they master whatever standard you were teaching? So as a teacher, we have to step back and look at the work. The other thing is, I'm not sure why teachers, <laughs> some teachers put themselves in there in that situation, correcting all that work. Uh, particularly if you're a middle school teacher, you have hundreds and hundreds of assignments that you're going to have to correct and actually go through. So be smart about how you assign things and how you're going to assess it. Problem, students refuse to do the work. Here's the possible solutions. Students don't understand the work. They just don't understand it. Particularly if you know your students and you should know your students between their data, things that you understand that happened last year if they're in your school, um, you have some notes, some anecdotal notes and their files, get to know the student, understand that they're behind. So if their grade levels behind and they're refusing to do it, a lot of reasons because they don't understand it. Third problem, exhausted with school policies and procedures, right? There's so much going on that with changes, policies and changes. As a teacher, speak up as the solution and be bold to give solutions to changes. One of the things that I love about teachers in their classroom, they're creative, they know what they're doing, they know where they're going a lot of times. However, they get overwhelmed, overwhelmed and exhausted by school policy and changes and then they, they talk in their inner circle as teachers. However, go to your school leader district leaders and say and speak up and be bold and give solutions to changes that you want. If you don't fight for your kids, if you don't advocate for your kids, who will? I mean, the worst thing a school leader or district leader can tell you is no, we can't do it. But if you don't try, how will you know? You can't as a school, as a teacher, just shut down and say, I'm out of here because I don't like the school policy and changes. Give solutions, give suggestions, be bold enough and say, listen, I understand where you guys are coming from, but I just want to put this in writing. These are some solutions we got together as teachers and we're thinking about our students and here you go. They will consider it. A lot of times we just don't do it and we just stay in our little classrooms and we do that whole, I don't, I don't like this, I don't like this. Be bold and speak up, okay? Um, come on, give yourself permission to be able to come a part of the solution. 
um, in those situations. So we're going to deal with problems by thinking differently. OK, I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, we've given a lot of information, but I'm going to shift because we talked about the why and we really focused on like what are the reasons behind that? And I think many of you all may have known those reasons. And I'm not just saying the kids are stressed out. I know you are stressed out as well, because a lot of these things that we're talking about, you only can do so much about it. You only can do so much about the home factor. You only can do so much about the resources. You only can do so much about them not coming in their attendance. I know you're limited as a teacher sometime. However, we're going to focus on how do we shift these reasons, OK? Um, and there's a great model. And at the end of this presentation, there's a, a bunch of uh, reference points, resource points that you can go on and go on the internet and um, just read through a couple articles that I got some of the resource reference points for. But we're going to talk about expectancy value cost model. Um, this model is really focused on the framework of how do we get students students actively engaged in their learning so there's this theory about the expectancy value it suggests that if a student's value active learning believe they can successfully participate in active learning and perceive okay perceive a low cost to doing active learning they will make the choice to deeply engage in active learning activities so you said miss shanina what does all this mean Students are more likely to get involved in their education and be motivated to do the work if they feel like they can be successful and it's not going to cause a lot of social, emotional pain, embarrassment, overwhelmness. We have to understand students are still in their development stages and some of the emotions that come with failure is overwhelming from them. So either they shut down or withdraw. So in this model, we have to help the student understand the value of learning, okay? Now you're saying, well, they should know the value of learning. They know if they learn, get good grades, do the best they can, be productive, they'll graduate, go to college and get a good job and live their best life. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the overall, but when you're in it and doing it, and if you think back on your education experience, your teachers, your parents, your community leaders, the people that were around you had to consistently remind you the about the value in learning. It was the people around you that helped motivate and close the gap sometimes. Um, and so we're going to talk about this briefly because I think it's important for us to understand there's value in understanding the learning process. So educators must answer the question, when are we going to use ever use this stuff? That means all the content and materials that you're teaching in your classroom. The students are asking, when are we ever going to use this stuff? What is the point of it? And so some of the reasons I have on the screen, we have to be clear about our learning objectives. I cannot say that enough. Tell the objective and the purpose of the lesson. Sometimes we get so excited, we just move right into the lesson or we assume they know, they don't. Um, and you may say to them as well, this may not make sense now, but let them know everything will make sense eventually as they build because a lot of times you're introducing concepts in the classroom just for exposure for them to build on so if you don't you might touch a little bit of uh, money understanding money and how it works in second grade but by third grade they're actually going to have to be able to count money right and be able to subtract and add so it's one of those things tell the students that everything you teach may not always make sense but it does build on each other okay Number three, connect learning to life goals. You have been in professional developments as a staff person, and you have said to yourself, why are we in this professional development? Why do I need to know this stuff? This is a waste of my time. And I'm not the only one who have thought that. You all have thought that like, why I'm in this professional development? Why I'm in this staff meeting right now? Because a lot of times it's not connecting um, your learning goals together. You, if you're a teacher um, in, say you're a gym teacher and they put you in an ela class to learn something you know professional development it's not helping you it's not connecting to your life goal as a gym teacher so you're like why i'm in this meeting i need to go um so that was just a quick example but the point is students want to know how is this going to relate to their life the, the issue is this the best solution is to the problem is to make every lesson relevant to the student okay so make those connections in the lesson because once I can relate to it as a student, 
I can apply it as a student. All right. So we're going to have to answer this question. So we're going to move a little deeper with this expectancy um, value model. And in here, I'm not going to read through the slide. These all this will be put on my website as well as the YouTube page. But an expectancy refers to a student expectation that they can succeed in that assigned task. So when we think about that, it's like I'm coming up. Can I do this? OK, they want to feel empowered that they actually can do it. They value comes to involving the student ability to perceive the importance of engaging in that particular task. OK, so they want to be clear on why they're doing this. And, you know, is this something that I can complete? And that's going to be attached to their behavior, whether or not they can do it. OK, um, the cost. This is an important thing points to the barriers that may impede, impede on a student ability to be successful on completing that assignment or activity. So it really goes back to, if I don't think I can be successful, then I don't know if I'm just gonna be, I'm not, I, I don't think it's not gonna be worth my time. The value, the cost of it is, what's the point? I'm just not gonna do it. Um, so let's look at this a little deeper. I love this model. You see the kid at the bottom? That's a lot of our students. Let's just make that clear. And that's a mountain many of them have to climb all the way to the top. Okay, so if they're really low and they're struggling and they don't understand certain materials that you're teaching. I don't know if you ever had to climb a mountain or went hiking, it will take your breath away, especially if you're not in shape. Okay, if your muscles and mind is not in shape, a lot of time is mental saying, can I climb this mountain? Can I do this hike and go all the way to the top? It's a mental capacity, believing that you have the ability to do it. It's no different with students not being able to complete and do the work, okay? So the idea is, the goal is I value. A goal I value is that I wanna do well, okay? That's at the top. And a belief is, can I make it? That's, that's the idea they're thinking in their head. But what will it cost me? Mm, what will it cost me? So you look at that student at the bottom. These are the things that are going in their head. I value my education, but I don't believe I can make it. I want to do well, but it may cost me being embarrassed. It may cost me getting many of them wrong. It may cost me feeling stupid and sad about myself. So I don't really want to go there. So I'm just going to shut down and not do it. Uh, you feeling that? I hope you're getting this. So, because here are the perspective from the student. We got to start from the student perspective to, in order to understand the lack of motivation of them not turning in the work. There's three important questions that we need to consider from the student perspective. Right here again, expectancy. Can I do the task? That's what the student is asking them when you pass out a worksheet or when you give a digital form or when you're asking them to read or break down this assignment or do this math. Can I do the task? The value is, do I want to do the task? And this is where the make or break come. If they want to do the task, they're going to try. But it's the teacher that intercede here and says, I know that you're worried about doing this task, but I'm here to help you because I know you can do it. Sometimes students are on, they will try, but if they're completely like disconnected from the content, don't understand it, feeling overwhelmed, many of them will just say, no, I don't want to do the task. And then the cost is, am I free of barriers that prevents me from investing my time, energy, and resources into this activity? And this is where it comes to the grading. See, the thing about grading, and I know that that's a whole nother seminar workshop, y'all, about grading in this country. And that's why a lot of people have moved to the number system and one, two, three, four, because that gives you more of a, some leeway versus an A, B, C, D, F, okay? Because F is failure. If I'm a student and I feel like I, you know, listen, we, we've been over these uh, math problems as it relates to doing this addition over and over, three uh, digit math, and I'm just struggling. I don't know how to carry. I, I, listen, I, my multiplication factor is all over the place. It's not worth my time and energy to do this activity because you know what? I'm going to fail anyway. She's just going to, he or she just going to give me a zero. So I'm just not going to try. You understand where this is coming from? They may start out wanting to try, but once they look at the content and really say whether or not they want to do it, it goes back to, I really don't want to mm, go there 
and invest my time and energy just to be a failure and get a D and F on this assignment. Okay, so this is when the perspective of why students are not doing the work, we need to consider these things. All right. I know that's a lot, but I really want you to understand when we start with the end in mind, what do you want your students to accomplish and really focus on the value of what you're trying to get out of that classroom, it'll shape them over time. There's an importance of them helping them understand the value of their learning. There's, there's value in let, allowing them to make mistakes and not grading every little assignment, okay? There's values in saying, you know what, you did it here, but I see you need some more strategies here because we wanna encourage the students through strategies and learning objective uh, that they can do it. So their initial response is like, oh, this is too hard. But as you break it down for them and clarify some of the, the content, which you will, and they feel like they can get small successes, it will increase their student motivation. OK. Um, and, at, you know, they may not all end up at the same level of motivation. Right. So you may have a, a level of 20 students and 10 of them are really struggling and each of them have different level of motivation. However, the overall environment and how you, you know, being productive with the course and how you're teaching it and how you're following up with it is going to help them. But we as educators have to start with the value in learning. And we have to start to think about, if I give them an F on this assignment at the end of it, what is it gonna cost them? What is the meaning of that? Is that something mm -hmm. I really need to do? Or may, maybe I need to just put a minus or a plus on this and let them know you did meet this, but mm, you're not that. Um, and so there's different ways you can grade and assess students without completely failing them, okay? I know I said a whole lot, but I'm very passionate about the why. And we have to understand as we move into the strategies, because we're almost there, I said about an hour, and so we're moving along. Um, we have to understand the importance of students will do whatever you need them to do as a student, right? So you're the teacher, and they initially are in agreement with that situation, whatever assignment. But as soon as they see the assignment and they feel like they cannot do the task, they're going to shut down. At that point, you have to intervene with some strategies. When you start to see those first three assignments not completed, like, listen, what's going on with you? I noticed you haven't done the last two, three assignments. As an educator, as a teacher, we should not allow those assignments to get seven, 10, 13, 14, 15 assignments behind. Because at that point, you're talking to them about making up all that work. Oh, they're really going to be defeated. They're like, mm -mm, I'm not doing it. I, there's no value in doing it. It's going to cost them too much, right? And so you as an educator have to pay attention and track that. So if you're using Google Classroom, if you have them turn in in-person work, as soon as you're able to do early intervention and track some of those things and use the strategies we're about to talk about, the better it will be for you early intervention, early tracking, noticing, saying, oh, I see you're struggling with this. What's going on? I see you shutting down. Wait a minute. There's a value you doing this. This is the meaning. This is what we're working on. It's going to build off on it. Hold on. You really have to have those strong conversations with those students that are struggling early on. Please don't wait till 10, 13, 14, 15 assignments later, because at that point you're defeated as a teacher and they're showing sure up defeated as a student. And don't even get talking to their parents about helping them make up all that work because the parents gonna completely shut down, if you know what I mean, okay? So here's what I need you to understand as we're going through this, because this is a very, I guess, controversial topic because it comes down to if the student don't do the work and they're not consistent with their work and we fail them, should they pass? And I've had students that honestly don't do any work, but if you give them assessment, they pass. And this is why a lot of people are moving to the standard based report card, because it's based on mastery. Did you master these core standards based on the common core? And if I can master do a pre-assessment or post-assessment and master it, whether I did, whether you assign 10 assignments or not, if I didn't do it, it still shows you that I master it and I understand it. So we can't just fail students for not turning into work. We really need to assess whether or not they have mastered certain skills based on the standards. And this is why it's important for us to have organized lesson plans following up, because at the end of the day, you know the school leader is gonna ask you why is your student failing? And so as a teacher, if you get onto, I cannot say this enough, 
if you use early intervention at the beginning of each quarter, you'll know within the first 30 to 60 days where your students are at. And then you'll know who turning in work and who not. So there are some strategies you can put in place early on so you're not chasing them by the end of the quarter or the trimester to turn in work. Because at the end of the day, we know you want what's best for your students as educators. That's not what we're debating. What we're debating is, why are the students not turned into work and how can we hold them accountable? Because students do need to be held accountable in order for you to do fair grading to really make sure they understand it. All right, here we go. So here's a quote. It says, the best education is not given to a student. The best education is not given to students. It is drawn out of them, okay? Yeah, you can pass out worksheet. Yeah, you can kind of go over lessons and give slideshow presentations and videos. All that's great. That's just given to them. Like, here you go. The best education is when you're able to draw it out of that student, when they're able to motivate to be able to do some of the strategies and apply some of the content that you taught them. And I really want you to check out that video that I did last month on teacher superpowers because active student learning is key to helping students move forward and be resilient and taking responsibility for their own education. It's not always on the teacher, but sometimes we make it that way because sometimes we just pour things into them and expect them to pour out. They need critical thinking skills, help them realize the value of their education through those conversations, through accountability, one-on-one -on -one meetings, and then hold them accountable to I'm here to help you, you're here to help me so that we can work together. So here's the seven strategies to motivate your students in a classroom. And again, I'm looking forward to you all feedback. I hope you're in the comment box. I hope you're sharing best practices because this is what it's about. Yeah, we stressed out, but we don't all have to be stressed out all the time. There's things that we can do. There's resources that we can um, move off each other and, and you know share with one another to help each other okay so here is the first strategy i'm excited we're going to get into it first strategy is this interrupt the cycle of failure this is a big one many times the students um internally i mean they they rip themselves apart um like i'm a failure i can't do it they have a lot of self-negative talk and you've been in places in your life where you felt defeated. Let's just be honest and let's relate here. And you feel like giving up. And if we have other factors, like if the kids don't have support, um, they don't have parents that understand some of the things at home, they're already behind, they're just going to shut down. So what I'm suggesting here is that you put in structures um, early on with the assignments that are easy, you know, structures that are put in place to have them feel confident with with some of the assignments so what does that look like if he or she is struggling with assignment focus on what they're doing well gently correct his mistake or her mistake without criticizing so it's all about the language here so if little johnny had 10 problems for the math assignment and he got nine of them wrong put a plus one on the top of his sheet don't put a negative nine now you saying, Miss Shanino, does it really matter? It does, because he got one right. Celebrate those small things and say, listen, you got one right. So that means you got something, you understand something here, but these other nine, we're gonna have to focus on and we're gonna do what we can to help you. Come on, put a plus one on there, celebrate what is right. It's so easy to say negative nine, you're wrong, moving on. That kills a kid's self-esteem and it breaks them down even more, okay? because they know how important that is. So they're gonna have setbacks and mistakes and let them know the setbacks you're having with these nine wrong, it's a part of the learning process. I encourage you to make mistakes in my classroom is what you have to really follow up with because if you be begin and help them enjoy more success, even at plus one, that builds their confidence. It's just, it's, it's starting with the positive and not always starting with the negative. We have to change our mindset. Interrupt the cycle of failure, okay? And help them understand that I'm giving you a sense of control. I'm giving you some choices so we can actively participate. Be clear about your learning objectives 
and make sure you create an environment as threat, you know, uh, threat and free. OK, create a threat, a threat and free environment. That means a safe environment where they feel like they can learn and is supportive. They can come to you. And it's like you at your job. If you feel comfortable with your boss and your coworkers, you're more likely to open up and talk to them and get what you need out and feel confident and more comfortable with your job. So we have to make sure we have those environments put in place, okay? So let's interrupt the cycle of failure. Give a choice of assignments. That's that sense of control. Um, and I know this is a tricky one for teachers. They like, give a choice. <laughs> Listen, you have a million assignments you can give. I mean, there's so much stuff out there with teacher pay teachers. I mean, there's so many teacher tools now. Give, as long as they're meeting the objective of what you want them to master, allow them to choose out of the three assignments. Maybe you give three assignments a week and they choose the one that they feel more confident in. Okay, give some choices. You like choices as well. You know, if you're at a a staff professional development and they only have one food option, you're like, I don't even eat that. But if they have three, you got choices, okay? And it makes you feel good when you have choices because you feel like you have a sense of control and you feel like, you know what? I'm motivated to do this. It's the same with our students. We gotta give them choices of assignments. And really, if the content is pretty much the same and it's, they only have to pick one of the worksheets, you're still gonna get the information you need whether or not they can master whatever you're teaching them, okay? So that may be a book report, it may be an oral report, it may be an art project. Um, you know that you have to learn their learning process and then give them an option to do so. So if a student is struggling with writing, but they can orally, you know, verbally express themselves well, have them do a, a, a flip grid, okay? Same, same thing. Now they might have to go back and work, work on the worksheet, but they may feel more comfortable doing the oral presentation, okay? So we have to look out for that and give, um, some wonderful feedback on given choices. Incorporate the student's interest into learning lessons. So you need to know your students. You gotta change your scenery. If you're always just lecturing and pulling out the so slides and not taking in consideration what the student's interests are, what are the students like? How can you incorporate, incorporate excuse me, some positive competition, offer rewards and, and offer variety of experiences in your lessons. So you ask the students early on in the school year, their interests, what they like to do, what they listen to. Um, and then you're able to take maybe some of the things that they do and incorporate in the lesson. So if they're into, if you're teaching a, a lesson on um, reading and they're really, um, really excited about a movie they like to watch, you can pull stuff from that movie, I'm pretty sure, depending on the content of it, um, and deliver some of those same thoughts and theories. We have to make it real life. We have to help make those connections because when we make those connections, that helps the kids' mindset open up and say, hey, I can relate and I can understand this, okay? So incorporate the student's interest into your lessons is critical, right? It's critical, critical, critical. We're almost done. Relate lessons to real life. I cannot say this over and over. Allow the students to work together on those lessons. Encourage self-reflection. Let them open up and share stuff that they may be learning in the content. So if you're teaching about money, perhaps you can let them know, you know, when you go to the store, what do you notice in the store at the cash register? What is the cash register doing? How is your parent paying for things? Um, you're making those connections as it relates to what they see and what you're teaching. Um, if you're reading a certain novel and it's connected to a movie, you can make those real connections there. If they are in sports or activities, um, if you're teaching certain content and you know you can you know, pick and choose, um, like, man, she said that she is in love with soccer, okay? And you're teaching a lesson on world history and there's a country named Africa that's amazing about soccer, or um, you can find ways to pull the whole content together, okay? We don't do enough of this. Um, there's a lot of things that we need to build off of, but students wanna know why they need to know this. And if they understand how they can apply this outside the classroom, they're more likely to motivate themselves to learn it because they can see themselves in there. If you're talking about plant life, have the students collect plants, okay? Take care of a plant. 
um, go on field trips, can make those connections. I know right now COVID-19, but there's tons of virtual field trips. Eventually we will be able to go on um, in-person field trips. Uh, if we're recycling and we're talking about the whole environment recycling, there's so many things you can do with that unit. We just have to be more hands-on, okay, with that. Um, so I'm excited about relating lessons to real life. It really makes a difference. Okay, we're going to keep going. All right, so breaking tasks into manageable steps. This is a really important task, a really um, important strategy, I should say. Many times the students give little effort because they see all of this in front of them and they just go into shock, like, I can't do this. So as a teacher, if you have an opportunity to small chunk some of these concepts and give step-by-step, step, particularly with math, okay? And that's an issue why students struggle with mastering math, because if you mess up one step in math, especially when we get to the formulas part, it's all wrong. So really chunking and helping them understand one step at a time and once they master that particular step then go to the next step um and then you make sure you give homework where they can apply some of those steps okay um and it's kind of a gradual lease so you're going to start out with a small task is a more as obviously as the problems become more difficult um you can kind of you know they'll pace themselves but initially we want to start out with the small success chunk some of the work that we're working on um, and then reinforce it with homework, okay? So if a student is really struggling with um, blending sounds and sounding out words, there's so many cards um, that you can give them, word sound cards, in which you can start out with the first base of the sound. And then you just build on that, whether that's through note cards, digital cards, and you have them practice that all week. Now, of course, they're gonna have to learn other things, but we have to reinforce some of the foundations of reading in order for the students to really understand. So yes, we understand the word is cat, very easy, but eventually they're gonna have to be able to move that to catch, okay? And we're gonna have to continue to build a vocabulary. So that gradual release and chunking it and breaking it down is so critical because it allows them to be successful and it allows them to be able to answer questions, okay? So come up with some goals with that, make it fun, definitely track their progress in that okay um little bit by little bit okay let's not all teach one lesson and just throw them all at one time and when you do this you want to be consistent the students need to know what expect to expect each week um because it'll help them start with that routine and be able to manage some of the some of the content that you're teaching okay expand your teaching style to spark interest this is a this is a this is a big one um so you coming up with hands-on activities is important. I know we do a lot of paper and now we've been on screen a lot. And the fact that the young people have had to use their computers, there's definitely a lot more interaction with that. Um, but perhaps they can do a debate. Perhaps they can do, uh, I know a lot of people do projects, uh, project-based projects where they can focus on hands-on um, hands activity. Science projects, social studies projects are key. Um, obviously, you're helping them understand the content by them actually doing. I talked about this last month in the teacher power session um, that students learn by doing. You have to help them do things, do hands-on activities. Science is best learned when you're coming up with hands-on activities. If we want to improve our math and science scores, we need more manipulatives um to help them have hands-on activity to move stuff to touch stuff to look at it um, we need that and if they're not able to experience it it's hard for them to retain it and so yes we need the books to work out of but we need more math and science resources and materials in the classroom um, and it needs to be a priority in order for our students to truly learn the content and that's going to spark their interest because again they learn better by doing, and you learn better many times by doing. It helps stimulate and retain a lot of those concepts. That's why STEM is such a big thing now, because if I can touch it, see it, hear it, I can do it. We have to make this a focus in our teaching style. All right, our last focus, uh-oh, there we go. Focus on the student's individual progress rather than on his or her performance in relations to peers. So sometimes when we're in a classroom, we look at each, each student and sometimes we compare them. 
Um, so we might have 20 students and we're looking at, oh my God, these 10 students are really failing compared to these other 10. And what I'm saying to you is that each child has their own journey. And if, if they are performing, um, if they're not performing they're at the level you need them to perform at, you know, you comparing them to other students and in relations to their other peers, every student is on a different level. Okay, that means that everyone has their own learning path. Let me just say that. Okay, that's why taking the data early on and understanding where your student is and coming up with those student success goals and those indicators of where you want your students at and really individualize. Okay, that differentiation learning technique is critical. Because if you can focus on their individual progress and have those conversations with those kids, even with their, you know, their test scores, okay, with the NWA or MSTEP, let them look at that information, dive into that information, come up with activities and small groups to help them build off of that individually. Do not chunk the kids. Now, I know sometimes we do small groups and that's fine. Um, that's great. But sometimes individually, you have to focus on where that child is rather than how they're performing with their, you know, as it relates against their peers. Sometimes that's not a fair measurement and students can see that if you're always comparing them to the high level students in your class, that would not motivate me to do well, because in, in the end, they feel like I'm just not good enough to do this. So really take the time out and evaluate your students and come through, you know, have that that portfolio, that assessment portfolio, make sure they are part of that conversation every conversation with assessments and help them understand i highly recommend once a month you take each student aside for 10 minutes whether it's virtually in a breakout room or one-on-one -on -one personally and explain their data explain their progress explain the things that they've mastered i wish teachers went over all before they turned in the report card to the school leader i wish they let the students see their report card first and go through where they're at and where they're going to be okay and then come up with a plan because students want to feel like they can do it and if i saw my report card before my parent did i would say listen i know my grades are not what they're supposed to be but i had a conversation with my teacher she let me or he let me know where i'm at and where wh where are the things i'm going to work on this next quarter and where i'm going to be we got to really spend time in that so again early intervention one-on-one -on -one meetings it doesn't take all day and I know if you are a middle school teacher or a high school teacher, this may be overwhelmed, overwhelming. So you may not do this once a month. You may just do it quarterly in small groups or something with your students. You may have to come up with a schedule or you may have to do a Google Doc or something, but you have to find a way to communicate to your students that you matter in my classroom. And I wanna not only help you, but support you through your academic success, all right? And so this is something that is so powerful as it relates to helping them motivate. So I hope you found this very helpful with some of the strategies. It's so important that we continue to help the students understand their internal um, motivation and we help them you know, manage their anxiety. That's why I said that social emotional learning is critical. And we help them make goals and hold them accountable to obtain those goals. And we give learning feedback and offer opportunities for improvement. Um, just like if you would get a job evaluation, you want to have an opportunity to improve on that, but you can't improve if you don't get constant feedback, more feedback with the student, not just you failed, you fail, great, great, great. Help them understand the why, help them understand the expectancy of what they're learning and how they need to value their education and what the cost, way, the cost may be in the end, all right? So I hope you found this helpful. Again, I'm just gonna go over these real quick. We're gonna interrupt the cycle of failure, okay? You're gonna start with the positive. You're gonna give more choices and assignments. Yes, we are. We're gonna incorporate some student interest in the learning. What do your students learn? What do your students like to do? And incorporate it in a Kahoot, uh, fun game trivia, different hands-on activities, in-person trips that they may love. If they like Roblox, I'm sure there's stuff you can incorporate with that. Um, relate lessons to real life, okay? How will, when I'm going to use this, how does this relate to my life? Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to break into break those tasks that we're asking to do into manageable steps. We're going to break it down for them. All right. Um, and then we're going to expand your teaching style to spark interest. We're going to do hands on activities. We're going to do engagement in which they are 
actively responding, a lot of small groups, group discussions, um, a lot of movement once we get into the classroom to engage, just sitting there talking to them all day is not gonna motivate them to help. So finding all those different techniques, pulling their name out of a jar, rolling the dice and saying, you're number five. And if I call number five, you better be ready. Finding ways to engage the students. And then we're gonna focus on the student individual progress. We're not gonna compare them to their other students in the classroom. We're gonna focus on their learning path and we're gonna give them tools and we're gonna meet with them consistently to update them where they're at. Um, and we're gonna track their progress. And we're gonna make it fun. We're gonna provide opportunities for success. Because if your students are successful, you as a teacher, as an educator is successful. So I wanna end with this because we're out of time. I hope you felt this very helpful um, because it's so important that we continue to um, work together and build on a lot of these concepts that many of you all may be doing, but this is just a reminder um, that we have to be intentional, intentional about building student motivation capacity in our classroom. Yes, we understand there's a lot of whys. And yes, there's a lot of pointing fingers. And I'm not gonna say people are not blaming teachers. And I hate that they blame teachers when their kids are not successful because a lot of times it's not the teacher's fault. But I wanna say this to you, success is the sum of small efforts. Success is the sum of small efforts, repeated day in and day out. I need you to understand the things that you're doing right now as an educator, it is going to work. It's the small efforts that you make every day. You repeat it in and out. And eventually that will catch on. And you will see that the things that you're teaching and pouring into these students do matter. And you're doing an excellent, outstanding job. So don't be too hard on yourself. Because here's the reality is, if you are, if you as a teacher, if you're doing the best you can as a teacher, that's good enough and you know what you're doing. It's easy for parents and even school leaders okay. sometimes or other people in the classroom to say, you're not doing enough, we need more. Oh. Uh, I get that. It, the, the job description of the teachers is going, da, 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 da. it's just widening. And there's no consistent uh, conversation as it relates to raises or uh, valuable feedback and resources either while they're expanding sometimes. I know that happens. However, if you're doing the best you, you as a teacher can, that's good enough. Don't overwhelm yourself and beat up on yourself as a teacher when a student is not, you know, meeting the performance level you want them to. They don't get the NWE score, NWEA score that you want them to. Um, they're not turning in their work consistently. They seem to be shutting down. It's not your fault. OK, as long as you're doing the best you can and you're thinking about and applying some of these strategies and tightening up and being consistent in your structure. Now, you have to provide that consistency in your structure and definitely have a discipline system with classroom management in place, as well as understanding that content and doing your lesson plan. So if you're prepared and you're doing that part, then you're good enough. You're doing what you need to do. All right. I just have to say that. Believe in yourself and all that you are, knowing that there is something inside of you that is greater than any obstacle, okay? So as a teacher, it starts with you. It starts with your mindset. Believe in yourself and what you're doing and the things that you're doing. Even if the world is telling you that you're not good enough as a teacher, you are good enough because what you tell yourself and what you put in, that stu in your students every day matters so much more than what anybody can tell you. And I really want to push that home, knowing that there is something inside of you that is greater. And so I go back to by Bill Reese, teach poor values, embrace the change, be bold, teach bold, respond bold, because in a crisis, we know that when we're pushed and, and you know, stretched, we come out better. All right, we come out better. So thank you so much for joining. You can definitely go on my website, Bill Reach Teach. I'm always here as a resource. Um, you can like me on Facebook as well as Instagram. There's my email address. And again, I am excited to continue along with the series to support you. I pray you felt this was helpful. I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. So if you want to put them in the chat, um, definitely share, share, share this link because we have a lot of students that are 
unmotivated, that are missing work. And it's important that the teachers and the educators understand the why, and we come up with strategies to help them. We don't wanna fail our students, we hate it. And that's what that video was about. It breaks our heart to see these students failing at the rate that they are. And I pray as an education system in America, we start to look at the grading system, some of the academic pressures in the middle of a crisis, like they're still trying to test these kids with MSTEP. Listen, that's my so proper, I'm gonna leave it alone. But at the end of the day, I know people are like, they need the assessment, we need the data. I get that, but we're in the middle of a pandemic. And so we need to be able to adjust and be flexible and build on what we have. And we don't wanna break the teachers down and break the students down and break the parents down. Cause in the end, it's just gonna be a terrible revolving door. Teachers are amazing. And so I thank you for coming. I thank you for your your commitment in the midst of a pandemic that you're giving your families and your district. All right, so reach out to me, I'm here to help. Check out my website, Bill Reese Teach. Be more than happy to support you in any way that I can. So definitely join us for our next section. Um, it is going to be on May the 8th and that we are focusing on um, this whole idea about parent and teachers. Um, how can parents and teachers work together to get successful kids? We're gonna create a parent teacher toolkit. And so I'm so excited because we know the parents are their first educator. Parents should be their child's first educator at home. But we know that teachers can build off that and they can work together. And sometimes um, working with parents can be overwhelming and difficult because you guys live in two different worlds. And so there's a lot of misunderstanding and sometimes it's um, frustration and anxiety that comes out of the parent-student relationship or the parent-to-teacher relationship. And so we're gonna talk about that in session three. So please, please join us on May 8th at 10 a.m on live, YouTube, Facebook, um, and you could go to BillReachTeach.com to learn more. Here are some of the presentation resources. Again, this will be on my website. Um, and you could also obviously look at the video again and get these information, the, um, the, the links in order to go in and learn more about some of the resources we talked about, about motivating students. All right, you all, until Hello everyone. I had to do a pre-recorded video this week. I hope that you enjoyed the teacher learning series today. It went over a little bit, but I was so passionate about just motivating our students in order for us to meet their need. I am here to help in any way I can. So please share the link. If you have any questions, I'm looking in my chat box. I don't see any questions, uh, but some of the people that joined us are educators. Um, they're friends of mine. And I would love for you to call me one-on-one -on -one or email, one, email me one-on-one -on -one if you have any questions. But thank you and have an amazing Saturday. If there's no questions, I'm gonna let the guys group. Thank you so much for um, just taking your time out um this actual saturday um and thank you for your feedback and who you are i really appreciate you all and have an amazing 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 day